Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. We are most pleased to welcome you to the 33rd year of the North Idaho College Public Forum. We have sat here for 32 years, starting our 33rd, and we think of all those wonderful guests we've had over the years, and we want to particularly express our appreciation to the PBS TV affiliates in the Northwest that have aired us for so long, and all those viewers who have been with us over the years. We deeply appreciate you, and we also are very appreciative to North Idaho College, the Board of Trustees Administration, for their support over this time. We thought it would be very appropriate to have on our first two programs of our 33rd year the President of North Idaho College, who's very instrumental in the progress of this institution and also very supportive of this program. I welcome Dr. Michael Burke. Our guest holds a baccalaureate degree from the University of Houston. He also received a master's degree from that same institution, and he holds a Ph.D. from the University of Texas at Austin. He came to us seven years ago, and under his leadership, we've had uh, many wonderful things to happen. Uh, Dr. Burke, welcome to our program. Well, thank you. My pleasure being here. And we want to divide our program into two parts. On the first show, we want to take advantage of your many years of experience in Texas and here, and you're very prominent in your work at the national level with the community colleges. And so on this first show, we want to talk about trends in higher education. And then on the second program, we're going to get much more about North Idaho College and the exciting growth there in facilities and the education corridor with the universities and the cities of our area. But with that, I welcome back uh, from many years, uh, Janelle Burke. Janelle, it's uh, hard to believe we've been doing it so long. And thank you for continuing your wonderful work on the program. You're very welcome, Tony. It's my pleasure. And I'm so happy to welcome back Erna Reinhardt, who is our freshman in a sense, like sort of <laughs> sophomore year, really. We delight that she's joined us last year and that you're back again. Thanks. And Tony. with that, we'll invite the first questions from Janelle Burke. Well, it's a pleasure to have you as our first guest, and very appropriate, as Tony has indicated, uh, to talk about a subject that's of special interest to me, higher education. Uh, I might have a two-pronged question. First of all, with regard to the trends in higher education pertaining to enrollment, am I correct in believing that across the country, more people are enrolling in higher education, studying for the future? And secondly, if that is the case, is North Idaho College typical of what is going on at the national level? Good questions. Really at the heart of what community college education is about. The first question is really about access, I think. And you will find that there is a growth trend across the United States in terms of access to higher education. And you'll see that, that growth trend really, I guess, washing ashore, if you will, with community colleges. Uh, we are the college of first choice for students who really are looking for some uh, higher education opportunity that's high quality, that is affordable, and is accessible, and is close to home. Something they can do as working adults, uh, students who have jobs in our community and need the ability to commute to and from uh, a college. Those, those are really the hallmarks of community colleges. It's not uh, normally a residential experience like you'd see at a university. It is more and more across the country becoming a commuter experience. And if you go back in the literature back in the 30s when community colleges were being discussed conceptually, uh, it was about access. It was about making higher education accessible to more and more people. In many ways, democratizing higher education was the language they used. And that is the trend you're seeing. There is a it's been referred to in the literature as uh, a tidal wave two, you know, baby boom two. There is an increasing number of college age students returning, or starting college, if you will, and then the returning adult population is being more and more identified as uh, an area of interest, if you will, for community colleges. And is North Idaho point, College yes. the same uh, as, is it following that same trend uh, as the national trend? The, the second part of that was, um, I have over my office a chart of our enrollment growth, and it is a 45 degree angle straight up. We've seen uh, since 98 when I got here and started tracking it, we had some uh, double digit growth in one year. Uh, we've tried to literally uh, narrow that growth down uh, without really excluding anyone, but trying to find something that's manageable. You don't want to outdrive your headlights where you have uh, an experience where students, yes, you admit them, but they have difficulty finding 
the kind of services they need. So we've tried to grow the institution incrementally as we've grown the student population. We've, uh, this year we have a slight increase in enrollment. We don't have the final figures yet, but we've had an enrollment increase, pretty typical, every year I've been here. And that's a, that's a national trend. Thank you. Senator Reinhardt. Let's talk about, welcome to the show, first oh, of all. Thank you. Let's talk about how North Idaho College is governed. If you could tell us um, how our college is mm -hmm. governed and maybe typically how colleges and universities are governed. And then also how community colleges, how North Idaho College is funded. Okay. I'll try not to get into the, the details of all the funding, but if I do, uh, let me know if I'm getting too abstract. But we're governed by a five-member elected board of trustees. That is common in uh, community colleges in particular. Uh, being a community institution, a commuter institution, <coughs> one that's supposed to serve a geographical region rather than perhaps a national area, uh, they have, in, since their inception, found it useful to have locally elected community leaders uh, serve as members of boards of trustees. It's a non-paying job. It's, uh, as I tell the trustees, the uh, hours are bad, but the pay is low. Uh, it's a non-paying job. It uh, is truly volunteer. A lot, of, a lot of the trustees really are doing it as a labor of love for the institution. Uh, they believe in what we're about and want to help bring the community perspective uh, to higher education. Uh, very typical of, of community colleges. In terms of funding, a little more complex. Um, the State provides us little less than 50% of our funding through a direct appropriation that we share 50-50 with the College of Southern Idaho. We're the two principal community colleges and we get a single lump sum appropriation, which is, which is unusual, I think, in higher education. But we have an uh, agreement with the College of Southern Idaho since, probably since Tony's been around, uh, where that's a, a even split 50-50 in terms of the funding. Uh, on top of that, we add another 20 25 percent of funding from students through tuition and fees and that has been increasing as a share of our total budget over the last few years and then the local property tax provides about five to six million dollars another 20 percent of our budget uh, we have uh, a large tax base here in Kootenai County uh, we've had the ability to lower that tax levy the last few years uh, keep it constant uh, as best we can and because of the growth in the county and the value of property in the county increasing, we've been able to, uh, you know, that does generate more money and allows us <coughs> to grow and meet some of the challenges of growth. Um, there is other monies that come in through federal grants, uh, financial aid, which is uh, for, given to the institution from the federal government that we disperse, uh, some $13 million last year. I got an email from the director of financial aid just uh, last week that said, Tomorrow we're going to give out $3.9 million. Uh, I didn't go to the bank that day, as you can imagine, but you know that money goes right back into the community in terms of, in some cases, rent, you know, rent uh, utilities, uh, groceries, that sort of thing. So we are we generate a lot of money through the institution because we exist here. Uh, I want to go on the national level, and okay. we have viewers in Canada and other states, and. Um, uh, I want to have some questions that relate to what's going on trends nationally. Uh, and I should tell our viewers again that you've been very active in national higher education organizations. Uh, on, the, on the one side of the ledger, I want to talk about what are some of the most uh, g positive and encouraging trends that are happening nationally in higher education. Uh, on the other side of the ledger, we'll yeah. talk about challenges. but. As you visit <clears throat> at these national conferences, what are you hearing and seeing uh, that is um, encouraging for our country? When I, and you're right, I do attend national um, conversations for that very reason because it's, I think it's important that we uh, think perhaps nationally and even globally about uh, the institution. On the positive side, I think there you will see, as we mentioned, uh, enrollment increases pretty uh, pretty standard across the board in the United States. The challenges of access that come along with that are something we can also discuss. You'll see an increase in uh, nationally uh, the number of minority students going to college. They come to community colleges first, typically. Uh, that has been part of our heritage, if you will, as a, as a higher education institution. And there is a comfort level there for minority students uh, throughout the United States and they do enter higher education 
uh, through the community colleges. I'm very proud of that and what we do. Uh, if I can just interrupt there, I think that <coughs> you have been a leader in also in relation to that, that once you have this more diverse population of community colleges, as far as curricula is concerned uh, and programs uh, in that area, um, I guess I'm moving on the other mm -hmm. side of the ledger a little bit, but it, uh, first of all, the very positive part is that the, uh, the, the diversity has come. But educators have been slow in dealing with it in the curricula and mm -hmm. are, are addressing some of those issues. Would you, uh, and I know you've contributed mm -hmm. to uh, making that, those administrators and, and boards and all aware of that. So uh, is that making progress too at the same time? When you have a diverse population, how very important it is to address a number of uh, of those issues that are human rights issues? I think with all these questions, where you see an advantage, you see a positive, there's also a challenge that trails behind it. Uh, as you mentioned, the, as more and more minority students attend college and higher education in the United States, the challenge then is to provide the kind of curricula you're discussing. Uh, the, the, that hasn't happened probably uh, proportionally. Okay. Uh, you'll see in our institution we made an effort with our uh, Native American students to provide uh, a variety of experiences. I, I kind of think of them as learning objects, if you will, in the curriculum. They're not, they're not a single course, but they are embedded in the curriculum uh, throughout uh, probably a dozen courses on campus so that that experience is not something that's specific to Indian students, but is uh, a flavored throughout the entire curriculum. That has not, as you mentioned, that has not progressed proportionally with the student, the minority student population. Another question, then I'll go back to the panel, because <coughs> I'm really <coughs> focusing on this. I want to give a, a compliment to the University of Idaho and North Idaho College, and I want to find out if that's happening around the country. Both those institutions have done two, I think, very major things in the last two or three years. One, they've taken a, a second look at their policies dealing with protecting people from all forms of malicious harassment and also looking at their civil rights policy. But the policy in place needed what one might call a comprehensive implementation plan. And the University of Idaho did it first, and we're in the process of just completing one. Mm -hmm. Is that, is the University of Idaho and North Idaho College a leader in that, or is that happening in colleges all over the country? Good question, Tony. As you mentioned, I'm serving on the Commission for Diversity and Inclusion uh, with the American Association of Community Colleges. Uh, that group. I think having that group, the fact that the association that represents all 1,100 community colleges in this country, the fact that they have a commission and they see it as, a, as an agenda item nationally and diversity and inclusion, I, I, I'm, I'm impressed with the title that they, uh, they afford us. But that is part of their focus, what okay. uh, AAC is about. Uh, the issues in Idaho uh, that we've had recently, uh, you're, you know those, uh, you've lived those. Uh, that may have uh, probably put us out as in front of this issue as okay. a community and as a state. But other, it's not just Idaho. The same issues in Texas and Florida and California and other states uh, are being addressed by higher education. Uh, yeah, and I, I'll go back to the mm -hmm. Janelle, but I just say that th those comprehensive implementation plans are so neat because they empower people, faculty, administration, students, so, and by empowering them, you can prevent some also some problems uh, in that process. Janelle Burt. One of the things that's going to be happening is that there will be a lot of people who are faculty members who are recognized uh, in their fields who will be retiring. And what is the trend nationally as far as faculties are concerned and then specifically with regard to junior colleges yeah. or community colleges, what are the faculty trends? If you think back to the 60s and 70s. I think we were building a community college in this country every other day. Mm -hmm. There was a large growth of spurt, if you will, in our history, and they multiplied around the country. NIC is unusual that it's over 70 years old. It's, we're one of the first community colleges in the West. The, oddly enough, I worked at one in Texas that was slightly older. I didn't, didn't really realize the history of, of community colleges uh, went back that far, but they date back to 1901. But the, hu the huge growth spurt happened in the late 60s, early 70s. A lot of that was fueled by the Civil Rights Movement and that Tony was uh, fluent with. But if you think what happened with that growth was uh, the need to provide faculty 
and we hired an awful lot of faculty in the 60s and 70s. Well, if you fast forward to today, that, that demographic is moving through all of our institutions and they are retiring. They're at retirement age and, and leaving the institutions. That is a national trend. You're absolutely right. The challenge to us, and we've been very fortunate in the last few years, but the challenge to us has been to find those gems out there who really have the kind of experience and training and education that we want to join on the faculty. And I know Erna and Tony serve on search committees. Uh, we do, we go out of our way to bring in the best and brightest that we can find to NIC. Are, are we seeing more of the uh, part-time faculty person rather than the full-time tenured individual? Nationally, yes, it is a trend. I think part of that has to do with funding issues that I think Tony will probably want to talk about. But the challenge to meet the access, to not, out, not outdrive your headlights by uh, growing the institution uh, in terms of faculty faster than the student population. You want to make sure that these are long-term commitments you're making to people. So the part-time uh, faculty member, who are extraordinary group of people who work for us, they allow a growth trend in a curriculum, uh, say political science, Tony, uh, as that curriculum expands and more and more students uh, enter that program, you have the opportunity to, to measure that growth with part-timers and then evolve those positions into full-time positions. I think they're a necessary part of the formula of, of staffing. I would just add a footnote. <clears throat> the presence, correct, uh, very correct. At least our experience here has been that our adjunct faculty are outstanding people, most all of them with masters. <clears throat> they're very high quality. Uh, and by using adjunct faculty, you can offer more sections and all and serve more students. On the challenging side, and adjunct faculty realizes, we pay so little around the United States for adjunct faculty that they can come and teach their class, but they cannot spend the day there. They cannot be there for advising purposes or serving on committees. And so that's the challenge the institutions face. But as I told one student, the choice is that uh, if we are going to serve all the students, we have to have more sections. There's not proper funding to make all those adjunct full time. That's the great challenge. Erna Reinhardt. I have a technology question for you. Um, technology has really changed just about everything that we do. And I know when I started here at the college, we used to mail press releases. And then we got the fax machine, and we were able to fax the press releases. And now we email them. So my question is, how has technology changed what we do in the classroom and how um, curriculum and instruction is delivered? Because it's very different than it was even five years ago, ten years ago. So can you address that? Sure. Great question. If you didn't ask it, I was going to answer it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> technology is, I think, the, the, the big elephant in the room here when you talk about higher education. It is, in, it is affecting I think higher education in ways we're just now coming to understand. It certainly has affected our students and how they look at education. The technology you find in a classroom over in Lee Hall or Kildow Hall is extraordinary. It is extraordinarily expensive too, but it provides opportunities to take that uh, class to Clark Fork, to Mullen, places where students can't commute. NIC to take a class. So it provides an opportunity. We right now are, um, we have a nursing program that is in a, in a remote, relatively remote area uh, that is being provided uh, electronically. That interactive video conferencing, and <coughs> internet opportunities allow us to reach people that are homebound, that are site bound, really cannot make it, you know, the 60 or 80 miles it might take to get down here. So <coughs> the it is a marvelous tool, but it is something that has to be used, I think. And that is, I think, the challenge to us is to find a way to make it facile, to make it something that is maybe transparent to the student. Uh, they certainly have the skills. Uh, younger students coming, the, the 18, 19, 20-year-olds certainly have the skills and actually have the expectation that we provide high-tech experiences for them. The, it will continue to evolve. We are, you mentioned the fax machine, and uh, I still remember phone registration. Tony mentioned my work in Texas. Uh, my institution couldn't afford to make the change to phone registration in a timely manner. So by the time we found a way to do it, 
that had already evolved off the page and we were going <laughs> to the internet. So there was an innovation step there we exactly. completely missed. Uh, that oh, we've okay. uh, leapfrogged into an internet uh, interface with students, if you will. They are finding us through the website more than we probably know. It is the front door in many ways to the institution. Good news? Yes. Challenges? Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, being able to do that, and you almost have to think of what you do in terms of learning objects, and these things are transmittable electronically all over the world. We just became part of an evolving concept called VPNet, Virtual Possibilities Network. Sixteen higher education institutions in the inland northwest are now connected by dark fiber. I love that term, dark fiber. It's simply fiber that's not lit yet. It is, has astronomical bandwidth. The, the ability to take those learning objects around the inland northwest, eventually to Seattle and out to the Pacific Rim, already exist. We're just now, this month, going to light this cable. It won't be dark fiber anymore, it'll be lit cable, and begin the conversation around the inland northwest, literally a conversation, and use the technology uh, where distance becomes irrelevant. Uh, and that's around the corner. Awesome. Long answer to a short question. Oh, that's good. Really good. <laughs> it's a very important one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very fascinating. I'll just add a footnote there. It's very hard not to make comments on this, on this particular subject. But two years ago at North Idaho College, we did an innovative uh, exercise at our lecture series of North Idaho College Popcorn Forum. It's been going for 35 years. We decided to have co-sponsors, and we had 13 institutions, including the Carr Center at, at the Kennedy School at Harvard, and we had all the universities and colleges in this area. And I was corresponding with the representative from Washington State University, and she said to me, well, it's going to be great to be able to share this with our sites in, in Vancouver and Pullman and Spokane, all around. And she instantly was sending information to all the student publications and students, and so you can reach a large audience. You can also actually have feeds from our lecture to other institutions, so there's no, no boundaries to that. On um, the ledger side of, of however of challenges, uh, as someone who's always been concerned that we keep education affordable to low-income people, which is so crucial, I've noticed in some data that I have seen that uh, around the United States, at universities and community colleges too, because of some challenges economically and in lack of funding from some sources, that's been a very significant rise in the last three or four years of tuition and fees. Uh, Dr. Burke, how do you see that working out in the future? Are we on the verge of maybe uh, denying access based on economics? I know we have a lot of wonderful scholarships and we have financial aid, which is a, one of the smartest things the government of the United States does, just like they did with the GI Bill after World War II, but um, how serious is that challenge? It's very serious, Tony. I'm glad you mentioned it. We've raised tuition the last three years. Um, it's not something you ever want to do. It is a hallmark of community colleges that you're affordable. I think I mentioned it. High quality, affordable, close to home. It's pretty much the three legs of that, that stool. And you can price yourself out of the market for some students where what you would look at maybe a 30 or $40 increase simply makes higher education unattainable. And that's not why we created legislation to form community colleges a hundred years ago. The idea was to provide access, pure and simple, and tuition, you're right, it is a national trend. Tuition has gone up around the country. I just uh, picked up the Chronicle of Higher Education and noticed that there, there may be less of an appetite for the continuation of dramatic tuition increases. It's pretty clear that uh, there is a point where students can no longer afford us. And I think we're approaching that point. I don't know, and part of it is local, the local, local governance question that Erna asked. Uh, the trustees are the ones who, by statute, set, set tuition. And they are, by statute, community members. And they have a very good sense of how, the, how this feels to the average person mm -hmm. that's working and perhaps supporting himself or children, single mothers. It, it becomes an issue very quickly. Uh, it's not anything we want to do, but you want to keep the other st leg of that stool, they're high quality. And if you don't have the funds to maintain that high quality, uh, to me that's a very slippery slope. One thing our Board of Trustees did, that, and I'm sure under your leadership, but an encouragement, but 
the different divisions and departments on campus have been given granting aids mm -hmm. from the, and I know I'm chair of that committee in our division and those stories we get are really tear jerkers, but it's so rewarding when you can provide some of that funding. Uh, Janelle Burke. One of the areas that I think things have changed in and is a national trend is the working relationship between community colleges and the universities and other organizations um, nearby. What are some of the ways that you have partnered up, if you will, with mm -hmm. other uh, organizations and also with universities nearby? And what, what are the national trends with regard to that issue? Well, let me start perhaps closer to home. Collaboration seems to be organic to Idaho. It seems something we do fairly, maybe it's just, I haven't been here long enough, but uh, the seven years I've been here, I've seen a growth, a conversation around uh, collaboration. Part of it may be sc uh, scarce resources. Uh, that's probably what uh, has generated our relationship with the University of Idaho and Lewis Clark State College, both of which cohabitate this wonderful little uh, uh, environment we are in here. Uh, they, they are on our campus, they teach on our campus, uh, we share faculty, which I think is unique. The uh, person in essence is on our payroll but uh, we are reimbursed for part of their salary from Lewis Clark and the person teaches part of their load from Lewis Clark. Wonderful opportunity uh, for both of us. It has that uh, untold opportunities associated with that. The faculty, the student has a seamless transition from sophomore to junior year perhaps because he may be dealing with the same faculty member. Those kinds, of, we're more aware of what, how, our, how our various curricula interrelate. But it has been a part of our fabric since long, probably as long as Tony's been here that U of I has provided the junior, senior graduate experience for people who are, in many cases, place bound. They're not going to pack up all their belongings into a U-Haul van and move down to Moscow. It's just not feasible or Lewiston for Lewis Clark. Having something here for them uh, where they, as I told um, the presidents of those two institutions, I don't care where they get a baccalaureate degree. I just want them to get a baccalaureate degree. And they can have all of our sophomores, uh, all of our graduates they want. I want to see them uh, participate at the junior, senior, graduate level in higher education. I don't care where. Just uh, we want to be part of that transition for them. It, we may be the, ber the best choice perhaps for a, a student who comes here as a freshman and is not sure that higher education is right for him or her. Uh, maybe after a year they decide uh, through our nurturing that, yeah, I'm ready. I'm going to go off to Eastern Washington. Uh, that is part of what we do too. We have a lot of electronic connections in the state. That has been a challenge uh, geographically, I think, more than anything. On that note, I bring the permanent conclusion that the clock always wins, oh, but the I'm good sorry. news is you'll be back next week and okay. we, we can share with that and also uh, some more discussion of uh, some exciting things, something we we're going to call the Education Corridor, and we'll do that at that time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've been so pleased to have as our guest today, Dr. Michael Burke, who's the president of North Idaho College and has shown very progressive leadership while here. And in this collaboration, we can talk about it again next week. Again, I want to end by saying how a pleasure it is to introduce our 33rd year and thank our very friends at PBS for allowing us to do this and be with us again next week at the same time when we will continue this conversation with the president of that old college, Dr. Michael Burke. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another